Yes, to wishing you a very good afternoon. Bizolaka ke mahadi wa ha kumalo anye zwing habutelezi. Ke ngwana wa tariento, daughter of the African soil. Born of Ozulu, Bagwena, Leba Hulukwe. Mang being a lay like Nina non get it to me so Huluna Bohe, Gathompo, Libui Gokobit, all protocol reserved. I'll just share with you some house rules that we have in order to have the webinar proceed seamlessly. All participants should please switch off their microphones and should also switch off their videos unless if they want to speak and also raise questions on the chat function that is seen at the bottom of your screens. Questions will be taken at the end of all the presentations. Strict time will be adhered to of all the speakers. Participants should also be coherent when asking questions or making comments. And to those of you who are unable to join us via Zoom, please join us also on the MRM Facebook page. And also these proceedings are going to be available on the YouTube channel. Please make sure to subscribe to it. Without wasting any further time, I'm now going to hand over to Father Smangali Somkadwa. A very good afternoon to you, Father. Good afternoon, everybody. Can I proceed? Yes, please. Right. Um, Madam Facilitator, and in the interest of time, all protocol observed. <clears throat> the MRM which I chair is deeply honored to host guests that include renowned thought leaders and representatives from various sectors of society. Madam Program Director will introduce some of them at an appropriate time. What is our mandate? is to initiate and coordinate programs that seek to strengthen moral and ethical values in our society. That's the mandate of the MRM. Now, this project was partly inspired by Madiba's passionate call for the RDP of the soul. His vision was to reimagine a new country which would be a radical departure from the aberrations of apartheid ideology and its evil practices. In 1997, Madiba had very strong words against corruption, violence against women and children, self-enrichment by leaders and families, drug abuse, materialism, lack of integrity in public life. Very sadly, today he must be turning in his grave. In 1998, MRM published what is now called the Charter of Positive Values, which is a powerful tool that informs all its programs. These values in the Charter transcend all race, ideology, politics, culture, ethnicity, and religious affiliation. What makes the Charter unique is its inclusivity it does not exclude anyone in society. But also what makes it relevant is it's a, a, it deals with people's daily lives and challenges and the role that everyone can play in enhancing the moral compass of our nation. We work with community organizations, institutions of various types. And we deal with issues of poverty, unemployment, gender-based violence, corruption, education, substance abuse, and so on, in our normal run of our work. Now, unfortunately, COVID-19 has disrupted our modus operandi, which includes regular communication with the people in their own areas, in their own places of work, in their own religious practice, uh, organizations, and so on, and so where the people are on the ground. So, but that's why 
we've now been compelled like many other organizations to resort to digital technology. And that's how we run our seminars in order to sustain our programs. Now, early this year, and especially after the lockdown was announced, we initiated a program of action. In, in June, for example, we focus on youth. In August, women's empowerment. And we therefore thought that September month would be an appropriate time to focus on the deadly implications of colonization, especially in developing countries, South Africa being one. MRM and CRL have formed a powerful partnership in order to ensure that such programs such as this one and many others are sustainable and that they begin to engage people. Unlike other countries in Southern Hemisphere, Africa seems to be struggling to extricate itself from the jaws of colonialism. Our days of independence are marked by hosting new flags, national anthem, and of course, a lot of jubilation. But whilst the colonialists may have departed physically, they always leave behind them their legacy, their system of governments and economic systems and economic influence and power, their parliamentary culture, their languages, and so on. Now, the continual influence is perpetuated by a comprador class, including also social dominant classes, who were socialized to believe in the superiority and greatness of Western European civilization. Amilcar Cabral, one of our great freedom fighters in Africa, want us to look beyond the song and dance at independence. In his own words, I'm quoting, the chief goal of the liberation struggle goes beyond its achievement of political independence to the superior level of complete liberation of the productive forces and construction of economic, social, and cultural progress of the people, unquote. Our speakers today will unpack the sinister character of colonization and the challenges we need to overcome in order to give substance to our own lives and freedoms and identity. Once more, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. I hope this dialogue will continue even after COVID-19 has subsided. Madam Facilitator, thank you very much and everybody please stay safe. Thank you very much, Father. Um, Technology tends to have its best on us at times. I will not waste any further time. I'm going to now introduce Professor Itumeleng Mosal, who is an academic, public intellectual, corporate finance manager, researcher, and business consultant. Professor Monsala's academic and professional qualifications include and not limited to a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Cape Town, an MA from the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom, and an MBA from the Open University in the UK as well. Dr. Monsala, welcome and over to you. Professor Masala. Professor Masala, are you with us? Okay, I will not waste any further time. He's probably struggling to connect. 
I'll move on to our next speaker on the program of the day. And that is going to be Me Arhasa, who is a commissioner at the CRL Commission. Commissioner Hasa Ki Me Ramukoni, and she has a dynamic and extensive experience having worked in teaching, administration, and cultural spaces. She holds a Master of Arts degree from the University of Pretoria. Me Hasa Unala Wana Me, are you with us? Sorry, Mahari, can we rather go to Nkosi, please? I'm sorry? Can we rather go to Nkosi, please? Is Commissioner uh, Hasha with us? Pro Program Director? Yes. I've just received a message that uh, Commissioner Hasha is struggling to log in. Uh, I think they're having a problem with their devices. Okay, so who yes. can we move on to now? Uh, we can move to the chairperson of the National House of Traditional Leaders. Can we move on to Ikos Mashangu? Uh, th thank you, Program Director. Um, am I audible enough? Hello? Yes, yes you certainly are. you are. Uh, it was sad. Yes, we no, can hear no, you. No, 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 thank you. I'm sorry I would not be able to, uh, you'll not be able to see my face because I've joined you via a, a cell phone. So, but um, good afternoon um, uh, to the chairperson of the board and to you, program director, um, the yeah. members of the board uh, of MRM. <clears throat> Uh, most notably, uh, the deputy chairperson of the house, Umama uh, Umshauli Ano Sandi, Umama Utukwana, Ubaba Unkube, Dr. Mtetwa, and not Dr. Bennyworth. Uh, our fellow presenters that are part of uh, this program, uh, Professor Musala, Mekhatla, and uh, Professor Sipamanda Zondi and other members of the house that are part of us um, in this discussion and all other guests and participants and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, let me thank the MRM <clears throat> for giving us this opportunity to participate in, in today's webinar. Uh, uh, Program Director, the scourge of gender-based violence that the country is facing is unprecedented to a point where it is now called a pandemic similar to the destructive effects of COVID-19 pandemic that is continuing to cause devastation in countries, including South Africa. As the institution of traditional leadership, we have during our Women's Month webinar pledged to continue our role in fighting gender-based violence. During our Heritage Month uh, webinar, which, was, which we also dedicated to celebrating our human living heritage, specifically women, we further pledge that customs that are deemed not to be in line with the constitutional provisions should be reviewed as they have been linked uh, to patriarchy and women abuse. I urge all South Africans to join us and make it their everyday responsibility to ensure women's rights are protected. We are gathered here today to celebrate our Heritage Month under the theme, open quote, reconstruction of the African identity post-colonization, close quote. This reminds me of Steve Bigo, the pioneer of the philosophy of black consciousness, who advocated for Africans to resist any attempt by any force to take or throw away their African identity. He wrote, open quote, that black consciousness seeks to infuse the black community with a newfound pride in themselves, their efforts, their value systems, their culture, their religion, and their outlook to life, close quote. The theme on its own is an indication that as Africans, our identity has been impacted upon. This is a statement that needs no answer as we all know what colonization did to Africans in every aspect, be it religion, politics, social relations, economy, and our 
our own way of being Africans, our own way uh, of living, because it has always been uh, how they distract uh, communities through making sure that uh, the culture of that community is completely uh, destroyed. So the topic that I'm going to focus on uh, is open quote, culture and tradition as tools for the reconstruction of the dignity or image of African people, close quote. One must first highlight that the institution of traditional leadership is anchored on culture, custom and traditions, which are important elements in, any, in an identity of an individual. Traditional communities and traditional leaders are viewed as the custodians of values that depict Ubuntu. They are custodians of culture. One of the institution's key characters is to promote peace and unity within uh, families and communities uh, for social uh, cohesion. Program director, the new government uh, has tried uh, to ensure that customs and cultural practices and traditions are protected and respected and that people are free to enjoy them. Uh, but I believe that uh, yes, uh, that is in paper, uh, but there's been very uh, little that has been done in practice to a point where we believe that the institution of traditional leadership being custodians of culture, uh, they've been on the sidelines uh, when it comes to issues uh, that pertain to culture, even giving advice uh, to government because there are structures that are there that are now responsible with doing that and having traditional leaders that are living with traditional communities being unable to do what is their role in terms of uh, being custodians of culture. So now that we have the tools to back us up in our endeavor uh, to decolonize ourselves and bring back our Africanness, it is time to remind ourselves that as Africans, our armament for success is our culture and uh, tradition. Now that it is, now, now, what is this culture that we talk about that we feel is important in ensuring our image, our dignity, in, in, in ensuring our image and, and our dignity is uh, reconstructed. Let me give you a scenario of some of our fellow Africans who were born and raised in foreign lands because of slave trade during colonialism. We have all heard them saying their roots are in Africa and they wish to reconnect with their ancestral land. You cannot claim your identity if you have no idea of who you are. That is what culture stands for. It gives you identity and an image of who you are and give you dignity. I'm identifying three key areas to focus my discussion on and all these relate to reconstruction of dignity using culture. The first issue that one will uh, uh, highlight is embracing our cultural and customary practices, embracing who we are. As the institution, we pride ourselves in our customary practices. However, we have also come to appreciate that culture is not static. As we develop as a people, there are certain changes that occur due to internal and external influences. In this regard, we also focus on reviewing any cultural practices that are not in line with the moral obligations of the institution of traditional leadership. We guard against anyone who uses culture to perform immoral acts in the name of culture. Think of the concept of Ubutuala, which originally was intended for two lovers. Uh, but now, because colonialism has taught us that our cultures are barbaric, people end up using these cultures for wrong reasons. Let us rise and embrace our culture. Because when you talk uh, of Ubutuala, uh, it was an intervention that uh, two people uh, that are lovers uh, to, to shorten the process of Lobola negotiations or when uh, parents are not agreeing to Lobola will then decide as the two lovers that they need to twala each other. Uh, but now you have people that are doing a lot of uh, criminality. I challenge, I challenge us all in this webinar to think outside the box, to bring innovations that will take our culture to a new level without losing the image of who we are. But the greatest lesson in life is that your identity matters. As we continue to celebrate Heritage Month, as the institution of traditional leadership, we celebrate our cultural heritage. We celebrate our language, our food, our attire, our art think uh, of Gogo Estamasangu, whose Nevela art 
paintings has gone global. She's also teaching young people painting. She never went to a formal school, to a formal art school, but she was trained in cultural settings. Let us embrace our culture, both for our image as Africans and for economic emancipation. As we are confronted with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are disheartened when voices on African indigenous medicinal knowledge were not fully acknowledged in pursuance of biomedicine. However, we had pride in seeing our African people opting to remember that our cultural heritage on environmental management, management has endowed us with the knowledge of herbs and medicinal plants to cure many ailments, even long before biomedicine entered the scene. You should have seen our entrepreneurs selling lengana, umshonyan in every street corner and along the road. And true, many of us bought our African herbs, including myself. That is what is needed, having confidence in our own cultural and traditional way of life. The second issue, Chair uh, and Program Director, uh, uh, that we want to put emphasis on is reconstructing dignity through land ownership and access. There is no dignity without access to land. As Africans, we know the value attached to land. It is priceless. However, colonization robbed us of our cultural and traditional relationship uh, with land. We know that in terms of culture, Africans are communal people. We believe in the culture of Ubuntu, the culture of sharing, the culture of togetherness. Where, where has that gone? Uh, colonialism has ensured we change our outlook to life by introducing an individualistic approach to land ownership. As traditional communities, we have a responsibility to protect our communities from losing their most important asset being land. Our forebears have died protecting this land and our struggle against colonialism has always been about land, nothing else because everything else uh, you know, over and above land is a cherry on top but land is of paramount because everything is based on land. So where is dignity in losing your property to financial institutions because you are unable to pay your mortgage? Or you stay in a square meter shack because you cannot afford the exorbitant and ridiculous fees to buy property. As Africans, we never had uh, homeless people. If you go to urban centers, people sleep on streets, under bridges, and any uh, undignified shelter they can find. In traditional communities, we ensure dignity of people by ensuring they have access to their ancestral land. We must guard against tenure that seeks to strip us of our relationship with land, specifically in traditional communities where the socioeconomic conditions are poor. If we lose our relationship to land, we lose our dignity. And how can we then say we have reconstructed our Africanness? Who said we should only opt for one form of tenure security? As Africans, we need to realize that the more we are unable to protect our ancestral land, the more we lose our identity and our way of life to embrace other people's relationship to land and way of life. How to then claim to reconstruct our image if all we do is copy other people's ways of lives and models uh, of polity. Uh, the third issue a uh, program director that one wants to focus on and uh, going towards uh, my conclusion is that educating South Africans, specifically our youth on significance of African cultures and traditions. As the institution of traditional leadership, we have partnered with many institutions. We appreciate Indoni for educating young men and women on African pride. We salute our traditional leaders who have initiated educational projects to teach youth about Amasibo or our cultures. We also appreciate our partnership with uh, uh, the Moral Regeneration Movement. I know, that of, I know that one of the key programs of MRM is education. Through education, it is possible to educate the youth on the significance of culture and its role in society. We have heard of many youths who were removed from school for wearing traditional bracelets, for wearing ubunyanga regalia, which are part of their cultural identity and religion and their dignity is denigrated. We've seen a, a student in one of uh, uh, the schools around Gauteng that was wearing his panda 
uh, who was also removed from uh, school premises because of wearing of his pants. But no one complains when other people wear items in the name of their religion. But we take pride in our constitution for protecting our customs and religious, and religious practices. There is a need to partner with the Department of Basic Education to have a full cultural studies program, which aims to teach children and teach us about African culture. We need to also teach the young and our youth the moral obligation to respect elders, women, and show respect and concern for all people, as the MRM puts it. Socialization begins at home and in the society. Let us do our part to root out the moral decay in society. Let us appreciate our culture and new search for social cohesion and nation building. Ubuntu is who we are. Let us reimagine ourselves. It is in our own hands as Africans. Countries that have put culture at the center of who they are uh, have succeeded. So as Africans, this is in our hands, not other people's. Uh, we need to ensure that we construct our dignity and image by accepting who we are and not what, not what other people want us to believe, to be the whitewashed African. Our cultures in their diversity becomes us to unleash our Africanness and Siabonga Kosi Masangu. Thank you very, very much. Um, please, we do apologize. We tend to have connection issues, as you heard, U Kosi Masangu is using his mobile phone. So we did hear most of your message and to those who do not know who Kosima Tlangu is, traditional council and served as, as the provincial chairperson of the Mpumalanga House of Traditional Leaders before being elected the chairperson of the National House of Traditional Leaders back in 2017. Just also to share with you some house rules, may I request that we please turn off our videos as it tends to also um, have, it disturbs our bandwidth in terms of connectivity and also in terms of listening to one another. I be believe that Commissioner to Commissioner Khatla, um, just really to introduce you to me, Khatla. Um, Mrs. Ramokone Khatla has a dynamic and extensive experience and having worked in the teaching administration and cultural spaces. And she holds a master of arts degree from the University of Pretoria. And she's currently with the CRL Commission. Me Khatla, are you with us? Over to you, Me. You need to unmute yourself, Commissioner. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Mema Khatla? Yes. Yes, now we can. Over to you, Me. Please proceed. Program Director, thank you for the opportunity given here this time. Chairperson of Moral Regeneration Movement, Father Kachwa. Chairperson of CRL Rights Commission, if he's here, Prof Mosoma, other commissioners, and ladies and gentlemen, 
The theme of your webinar is most interesting to me, the reconstruction of the African identity post-colonization. It is to me an indication that you are already focusing on the challenges and issues that may impact on the work of the commission at the turn of the next decade. We are reminded to put together regional assessment of the accomplishments and setbacks of our mandate to date to use the assessment as a basis for evaluating present policies, goals, and methods, and then to develop plans for the future. Now, this is the topic I'm going to dwell on, relevance of indigenous knowledge and languages on the modernization of society. The Constitution of South Africa, 1996, recognizes the existence of 11 languages that are spoken in the country. It goes on to amplify that recognizing the historical diminished languages of our people, the states must take practical and positive measures to elevate the status and advance the use of these languages. As a consequence of this clarion call, the constitution went on to affirm this by establishing a chapter nine institution commission for the promotion and protection of the rights of cultural, religious and linguistic communities. It is therefore important to explore relationship between the indigenous knowledge and the languages in the modernization of society. It is worth noting that the concept modernization is itself problematic in that it does not purport to be transformation driven. Modernization is akin to facelift a car without tempering with the engine. Be that as it may, the reality is that indigenous knowledge as well as languages have been with mankind for as long as it first occupied earth. The question is what indigenous knowledge is. Indigenous knowledge is parochially explained as knowledge that is unique to a given culture and society. In other ways, indigenous knowledge until shared on a global scale is confined to each society in its geographical setting and is understood and is practiced in language and environment unique to such circumstances. No wonder language is considered the gold standard through which cultural, behavioral, as well as world outlook is filtered through. It is through indigenous knowledge and languages that rivers, animals, herbs, mountains, villages, and forests, among others, derive meaningful names symbolizing their impact on society. Indige indigenous knowledge and language play a pivotal role in explaining, defining historical moments in the life of a society. The explanation of historical events such as war of Maliboho and the Africana and Isandwana, Mahoba, and the South African Boer Republic and others using knowledge and languages brings into relief the contrast in explaining modern history. Hence the need to reappraise such events using modern tools 
interpretation to give context to a broader usage of indigenous knowledge of oral history. Indigenous knowledge as well as languages has direct impact on regaining self-identity and pride in understanding modernization in renaming places in their proper names in society. For an example, the Oliphant's River in Limpopo, Eslepelle, or Lumbelure, Dwas River, Mununu, and Potchitas Res as Mokopani, Mokopan Chadichava. Use of indigenous knowledge and languages gives us a rich tapestry, socioeconomic, and diverse interaction of various communities which it, with each other over many years. The relevance such as knowledge in state and nation building is of great significance to a modernizing society still grappling with the challenges of development and transformation. Certain cultural observations and taboos which are being practiced in the modern and modernization when modernizing society have been maintained through the years through practice as part of indigenous language, observation of harvest, eating of fruits and libation, observation of rites of passage by both male and female and its meaning in changing of the world of ours. Language is the medium through which indigenous knowledge is transported from one generation to the other through oral and lately written ways. Language like indigenous knowledge is a constant mode of change. They both seek to evolve and give meaning and impact to new challenges and modernizing and modernizing world. It is obvious that languages have over the years responded to challenges of the new developments by developing new concepts, for an example, drama, moto vehicle, sifatanaga, intonga, shipanda, managa. By the way, I'm from Limpopo. I know this language is of Limpopo. Indigenous knowledge is not a stepchild of modernization. It has always been a state of change to respond to challenges in the world, which is forever changing, placing new demands that have to be responded to likewise. It cannot be argued that indigenous knowledge as was indigenous languages have been relegated to the periphery of mainstream social, economic and political enterprise. It is worth noting that derogatory labels such as witch doctor has been replaced by concepts such as traditional healer. Indigenous knowledge only has one concept, Ngaka, for both traditional healers and Western medical practitioners. Indigenous knowledge and languages, which have until recently become toast of NGOs and POs, not-for-profit organization, and other multilateral institutions as being on the verge of dying, have become the flavor of medical inquiry, the COVID-19, that there is need to investigate the impact of traditional efficacy to treat such pan pandemics. It is accepted fact, it's, it is an accepted fact that indigenous knowledge was and is used in many communities in the use of herbs to cure ailments, 
such as flu, headaches, muscle aches, and others. We, we do have Golimpopo Lenukwani. We have Serukulu. We have Mpalajamaru and others. It is therefore heartening that indigenous knowledge is gaining tracks in a variety of research, academic sphere and government. One can conclude by making the following assertions that indigenous knowledge and languages have to be promoted in line with the constitutional provisions provisions of the Republic of South Africa, 1996. That indigenous knowledge and languages must be preserved and maintained through written, audio, and being used by the practitioners. That institutions such as universities, libraries, museums, archives must be repositories of both indigenous knowledge and languages. Research institutions, language laboratories, cultural acti activists and practitioners collaborate in the realizing of this effort. Medical research institutions tra and traditional healer practitioners should also collaborate as they do on HIV AIDS training. Private institutions, non-government non uh, organizations, government and multilateral organizations should make resources to achieve the goal. Chapter nine institutions must collaborate as part of fulfilling their constitutional mandate. Engage practically with the youth in knowing their praise names and poems from their own communities as the preserver of family, societal origins, family tree through CRL Rice Commission. And I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And just to share once more what ECOSI and Commissioner Hatla have spoken about. ECOSI Matlangu spoke about the culture and tradition as tools for the reconstruction of the dignity and image of African people. We need to take pride in our Africanness. And Commissioner Hatla has also just shared with us on the relevance of indigenous knowledge and languages in the modernization of our society. A big thank you, Me. The Moral Regeneration Movement has actually decided today to organize this webinar, as Ufadam Kashwa mentioned, as part of its contribution to the Heritage Month celebration. This is done with a view of creating a platform for reflection on the historical challenges that the African continent and its people have had to endure, including how those challenges have impacted on the African identity, thus bringing us to the reconstruction of the African identity post colonization. I'm now going to call on O Professor Zondi. And O Professor is a professor at the University of Pretoria and coordinates the Department of Institute for Strategic and Political Affairs, which analyzes strategic dynamics in national, continental, and international affairs, including decision-making, leadership, norms, values, and agency. He also oversees the Center for the Study of Governance Innovation and the Center of Mediation in Africa. 
between 2004 and 2016, he worked first as the head of the Africa program for the Institute for Global Dialogue associated with UNISA and later as the head of the Institute itself. There's just so much to say about o Professor Zondi, but without wasting any time, I would like to please welcome Professor Zondi. Over to you, Bab. Uh, good, good evening, and uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Program Director. Uh, for Can your... you please switch on your video, Ba? Uh, let me try it. Thank you. Is it, is it showing now? Is it showing now? It's not showing. Oh, okay. I think it is showing now. Hello? Yeah, it's showing now. Yes, yes. proceed, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very please much. Proceed. Thank you very much, Program Director, for your kind introduction. And uh, I want to pay homage uh, to the chairperson of the Moral Regeneration Movement and uh, Father Mkacho and the, the leadership of the CLR Commission uh, present here. And I want to say by it to in course, we respect to a lot. Um, I have given a, a, a a task that it is uh, obvious, which is to look at what has been called the rewriting of colonially constructed history. Um, it is a, a subject that is pertinent given where we are now, not just because it's a, a heritage month, but because we are in that period in South Africa and in Africa where we are challenged again to think about how do we decolonize everything around us? How do you decolonize knowledge, which is a big issue now, especially in universities and other institutions of higher education? How do we de decolonize the state? which we inherited and democratized, but needs to be de decolonized. How to decolonize the economy, which we inherited and continues to feed those it was designed to feed, how to decolonize it. So in the process of these discussions about decolonize, decolonize, people ask the question, what do we really mean by decolonize? Everything is run by black people now. Uh, we have a black government and we have black uh, captains of industry and all of those kind of things. What those people don't realize is that the argument is not de-racialized or it is not change the race of those in, in power, but it says decolonize. Uh, for to decolonize is more than changing the faces and names of people who are there. It's not even wearing a traditional wear, uh, clothes. It's not even uh, speaking your home language goes beyond all of those kinds of things. It is about understanding what did colonialization imply for all aspects of our life? What did it imply for our psychology? What did it imply for our spirituality? What did it imply for our language? How did it imply for our self-identity? What did it imply for our power relations? What did it imply for what we know and what we do not know. What does it imply for what we know about our history and what we don't know? And because all of those will explain for us why we need to decolonize. Because we've come to know that while the colonial government lives and it lives uh, quite uh, obviously and very openly and an independent government comes, but the colonial structures of power don't leave. The government changes, but the colonial structure of power undergirding that government do not leave. Uh, the colonial teachers leave, but the colonial education remains the head of those to whom it was passed. 
So colonialism's biggest success for me is the fact that it does not need a white man to perpetuate it. It knows how to sit in the head, in the spirit, in the soul, in the conscience of a black person and perpetuate itself in a very black person, even one who is anti-colonial and making slogans and all of that. They can be very anti-colonial in speech and very colonial in their ways of life. They are menarism. You know, we're talking to one colleague that one deep, one deep way that colonialism happened to us is the fact that we don't even know how to exclaim in our languages anymore. We, we all, when we see something, we say, wow, whose exclamation is that? So even the mundane things about how when somebody scares you, Uchuga in English, you, 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 you're scared in English, <laughs> you're scared in another culture and not in your own country. So it's a very deep system and all that. That point I wanted to make is that uh, I would like to borrow from Ngugi Wationgo. <clears throat> Ngugi Wationgo writes a book, <coughs> excuse me, which is entitled Something Torn and Apart. It's called Something Torn and Apart. And there's a meaning in that title. In that book, basically the message he makes is this, is that at our encounter with colonialism 500 years ago, there was a dismemberment that happened. And that, that is the most important thing that happened. Other things happened, of course, the land was taken, uh, we, were a colon we were suppressed, uh, we were thrown into dungeons, uh, when poverty, you know, all of those things happened. But fundamentally what happened was a dismemberment. What does he mean by that? He says, the dismemberment at least at three levels. The most obvious dismemberment we know is when people were separated from their land, what was called dispossession. So they were dismembered. They were membered with their land. They got dismembered and from their land. The second one that is also obvious is that they were dismembered. There were people who were dismembered from their self in physical ways. What happened to King Riga when he was captured and he had his, his head chopped off, his body was buried where his, his head was not. So he died dismembered, his head somewhere else in a museum in Europe and his body in, in Africa. And he, he was, was buried with his head facing down, which is a form of a curse. The head and down. What happened to Ngriga happened in over 20 countries on the African continent that there would be this leader who would be captured and would have his head chopped off and he would be buried against the tradition that many people in this part of the world, they will bury people facing the, the place of the rising of the sun or placing in Central Africa a mountain so that they are a good spirit on after life. In this case, they were buried with their face down. In other words, they would be ash. They would be shamed before life, and they would be shamed after life. And these things were all orchestrated everywhere. There were a number of those leaders who would be chopped off in the midst of the people, in the midst of the people, and they would be shamed, and they would be buried with their face downwards, so that they become what in Zulu we call umkoka omobi, a bad and an evil spirit among the people that are, are there. So that, that happened in a number of cases. In some cases, the leaders were then exiled. The process of exiling, it's a technology. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, systemic, it's a systemic thing. To be exiled is to be uprooted from where you belong, your spirit belongs, your, your soul belongs, your mind belongs, and we put in Santa Elena pit in Robben Island. That is designed to dismember the person, the body of a person from their soul and from their head and from their, their, their spirit and from their mind. And that processes happen frequently all over. Uh, they were also dismembered by identifying among them a person who would be called a mad person. Uh, and create that 
if they don't create them, they will create a story about them. To create a sense that you are a mad people, uh, identify somebody with mad people and becomes a story of that particular nation about the main people. In our case, they created a, an unexisting person called Nongauze. And Nongauze was a person who asked people to, to kill off their, their, their property, uh, to, 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 to destroy their world, so that when white people came, they never killed anyone. People were led by Nongauze to death. So the idea of an African witch was used right at the beginning as a myth to shame these people and confuse them and plant a system that would outlive a physical system. So that when we remove a colonial government, but a system that was created through no, a story of Nongauze and a story of Ushaga, which doesn't actually exist, uh, they would live by it and it would condemn them to failure long after the colonial system has left. So there was a dismemberment, which uh, the third dismemberment that Nguki talks about, which was a dismemberment of people from their memory. There was a deliberate process of cutting people off from the history, uh, from the stories of their past, so that they will not be able to remember anything before colonialism. They will only remember from colonialism onward. Because that story of colonialism onward places the white man and the colonial man at, at the center of our history, which is why we have very little recollection of colonial history. I get very uh, amused when people talk about King Shaga as a pre-colonial person. No, King Shaga happens in the colonial period. The story of King Shaga is told by colonial leaders. That's my king. Uh, the, many of the stories are told by missionaries with a purpose to plant a particular idea. And me being called Zulu is a colonial idea as well. Just as you being called Sutu is one, you, the hair being called Pedi is one. Because all of these identities do not exist before 1820. No, ISIS, no one calls themselves Zulu before 1820. Actually, nobody called himself Zulu before 1842, when a missionary called A.T. Brandt uh, decided on the term. There is no Pedi, by the way, before 1852, 53, sorry. The Vanda, the Tsuhana, all of them are colonial identities that are created much later with the help of missionaries. And the, 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 this dismemberment of us from our history and our memory was to plant a memory by which we can live and even kill each other for a memory that is not ours. King Shara doesn't exist as a figure that is presented. The Europeans, the Germans especially, were recreating a Napoleon and told a story. The whole story of King Shaga is told by A.G. Bryant. And A.G. Bryant tells the story when he was in the south of Durban. And he tells about a story in the north of Nongoma, which is about 400 kilometers away from where A.G. Bryant was before the age of cell phones. How does he know all of this? He tells about a Shaga he never met. He tells about a people he never actually met. But but the power of colonial rule is to impose that story and make us feel proud of it so that we can then operate on the basis of that story. And that story implicates us in all the problem. That story says we, we are bloody. That story says we cause problems among ourselves. We emptied the land and then white people found an empty land. All of that story is manufactured with an end in mind and the end is not about us. And therefore, the indigenous as well must be investigated. What is indigenous and what is not indigenous? Because there was a whole system of what is called native commissioners for every province of South Africa. Their duty was to write the new story of an African, all the provinces. 
Many of the stories you have about what is our indigenous things come from a colonial order. Of course, we got oral stories from uh, our forebearers, but don't underestimate the power of the colonial system to give us the indigenous, including the tribal. We did not have tribal systems. The tribal system I invented only in the 18th century. The earliest people who are spoken to in this part of the world, when they are asked, who are you? They say, Singabantu Baka, we are a people of, meaning follow this person, we follow this person. When they learn to call themselves Kosa, is only in the 1870s. Actually, even in the early things that they do, they had a newspaper, it was called, is it Gidim Sabantu? But in the 1870s, they need to change it because the native commissioner, who is a white man, required them to do it. And they now had to call it Isikiti Misamakosa because they were uh, uh, very opposed to the idea of us calling ourselves Abantu. Because when we call ourselves Abantu, we are then a, a, a people of over 300 million people. But if I call myself Zulu, I am a people of 8 million people. Insignificant. I don't go anywhere. I think others are an enemy and all of that. Just get to check it carefully. Even the people that you call Tswana, they mix of all sorts of people and they are found the same people among the other groups who might be called Pedi, who might be called Swati, who might be called other things. It's all concocted making of an identity of the people which was designed to create a possibility to manage us even after colonialism. Therefore, in rewriting our history, we must not avoid the most painful one, that many of the things that we hold dear as being our things may not even be our things. They were given to us with a curse on them so that they will curse us to this new identity, which is not our identity. Riba, two, but this pleasant area. I mean, we are not Swan, but Swan. We are not any of the things that we do. We are first and foremost human beings because our logic of life was that we are human. And what we do is boo two, boo two. Everything else you can do, like being Zulu, which does Zuluness, it's not our game. Our game was we are people we do Ubuntu and other thing or not. So part of what we need to rediscover is to rediscover the memory that we were dismembered from. That is why in closing, and Guki Wationgo says, what we need more than independence, more than creating the things that are ours, uh, as reestablishing all the things that we have, uh, all these other things we like to, what we need is a remembermament. We need a remembermament, but that remembermament must remember an African with their land. That my land is not in Guadalupe Natal. My land is in Africa. The idea of my land being Guadalupe Natal is a colonial idea. I don't belong in Guadalupe Natal. There is no Guadalupe Natal in my, in my cosmolo cosmological knowledge. I belong to Africa, which is why my people, or people who speak my language, could travel and be get accommodated to the north of, of DRC, all the way to Benin. But they lived anywhere in this land, which is the land of Gondwana. It's all my land. The idea that I can't go to Pumalanga because I must confirm whether I'm Debele or I'm uh, Swati or I'm Aima, it's, it's a colonial idea. But these colonial ideas are so powerful that they have been built into us as a mental empire because we know how to deal with a physical empire and say, Britain, have your Britain. Let me have my Zimbabwe. But we want to keep a Zimbabwe with a Britain in our head. That's a problem. And it's a problem of how we've written and taught history. We have taught history to completely, continuously regurgitate and repeat the stories what are. What we need is a rememberment with our land. It's a rememberment of the head with the body. The head of Ngiga, which is in the UK, still cries out to us 
as a head, which is Western, which is Eurocentric, which thinks white, though the body is black. That story of returning things where they belong never happened. We have never atoned for the, for the dismemberment. We have not gone back to remove the spillage of blood, to reverse the curse of the burying of King Gap downwards, of the burying of, of Ota Obenga downwards, and many others downwards. We, we need to do that, and our history must, must repeat that story that we need to, to undo that damage. And lastly, we need to remember with our memory. So we need to remember, we need to reconnect with our memory. And in order to do that, we must remove the colonial distortions. Even if they, we, they make us feel good that I am a Zulu and I'm supposed to be more violent, I'm supposed to be more, I must follow the Shaka character that was created, I must be like that. And I'm a Sutu, I'm supposed to be more cordial and I'm supposed to be more uh, diplomatic to follow again the character. And then the Mushasha existed, but the story about him has a lot of inventions. I must follow a vendor character uh, because, um, uh, as created by the system. We must undo this old memory, this, this colonial memory, and reconnect with the memory that enables us to coexist with all Africans and to exist in Africa and to refuse to exist in South Africa. And, and, and because South Africa is not our thing, it, it's not our container, it is not our idea, and it is even not our spiritual empire, it's somebody else's. We will not be able to do that unless we reconnect at physical level, reconnect at spiritual level, because colonialism was very spiritual curses, and we need to connect also at psychological level at the same time. If we don't do that, we will speak talking about freedom that is coming tomorrow and Uhuru will not come. Thank you very much. We can't hear you, we can't hear you. Uh, you can you hear me now? Very clear. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear doesn't you. That dig, I get. So the story of Shaga doesn't exist. Thank you very much. I'm totally puzzled when you say that the story of Ushaga does not exist, nor the story of Ungauza, or even the story of Uking Mushweshwe. Um, but thank you very much, Professor Zondi, um, when you spoke to us about the rewriting the colonially biased history in our institution of learning. We have to apologize. Oh, Professor Itumeneng Musala was unable to join us, so we will have a little bit of time to take questions and answers. And I'm going to request Ufadam Mkajwa and all the other speakers to please switch on their videos just so that everyone can see them. And anyone who is attending as a guest is welcome to, you can actually comment in the chat section at the bottom of your screen um, or even pose your questions to any of the speakers. Please, the floor is now open for question and answer. Would you like to say something based on all the speakers? My own contribution really was just to uh, on behalf of MRM to welcome the speakers, our guests, but also just to say a few opening preliminary remarks and, and so on. But uh, the, the people who should really now take the, the, the center stage would actually the people who made a contribution, to which of course I'd be quite happy to contribute as well, you know, but uh, uh, this is their show now. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much, Father. We will now take questions. Uh, please turn on your video. Hey, I see a bona ge ikosi masangu. Ahe, kiring mere alocha. Hey, Tobe. Hey, Tobe. Tobe. I'm now equally confused now that I'm told that I am not Zulu, nor am I Sutu, <laughs> um, but I am Umundu. <laughs> So, Kitlaleka, Kitlaleka, do me the Sakapuo, so thank you so being a Lelanga, Namali, me wonke, Gitella, Ubuti, give Vuleg, Ituba, Ubuti, Abane, Mibuzo, Babuze, that the Kotulo would you like to pose any question today? Are there any comments from um, you, Mehash? You are muted, Me. We can't hear you. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I just want to say that I want to be Professor Zondi's student at 70 years. Of age because I want to reconnect. <laughs> I want to know what is indigenous and what is not. Then I'll just need a whole lecture with him. Thank you so much. I appreciated your paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Me. And Iko Simatlangu, do you have any comments for U Professor Zondi? Hey, who's the deal in No, no, yeah, it, 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 yeah, no. Um, I think U Prof has brought a very a different dimension uh, mm. to what we know um, as our cultures, as ourselves. Uh, so I, yeah, I think you know. And I'm not I'm so sure and or what. But yeah, I think you know we 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 should engage more. Yes. Uh, uh, because mm -hmm. I think if we are saying this is not true, then all of us need to sit and say what is the truth, you know? Um, because I think some stories, yes, there would be stories that are not true. Uh, there's been a lot of colonial influence but other stories are still told by our own people. And a lot of uh, what we call nations are called by their uh, kings or chiefs or whoever uh, that was leading them, you know? So yeah, I think yeah, we, we, we have to find ourselves. We need to have these discussions uh, a bit more. Namija, I wish you I would be a professor student and get to really understand, um, you know, and try to find the truth uh, in what he is um, uh, saying. Because I think some stories are told by very old people uh, that this is what was happening and what have you. But I haven't had uh, this version though uh, that we are getting today. So, but I, I still want to learn a bit more. Uh, but I'm happy that I was part of this discussion yes. and I was hear what Prof uh, was saying. I think it has made a lot of us to start thinking yes. uh, out of the box than the boxes that we've been put in. Because I believe that the colonialists have put us in boxes. So now we need to start thinking out of those boxes. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I take a please proceed. Again, so my Professor Musoma here. Yeah, Prof, sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm not so sure whether we are interpreting uh, uh, Professor Zondi well. I don't think he's negating the fact of no. history. No. Re remember that um, 
he's speaking about the uh, 1800s. And um, you remember the 1652 story. And uh, the, the whites, when they entered um, continents, uh, like our, our continent, they did not found, find a homogeneous communities. They found communities in different stations, which is why their aim was to make sure they should not unite. The use of these concepts is to make sure we never unite because our strength was in our unity. So there are certain um, um, distortions that have entered because they had a particular agenda to achieve. And that uh, particular distortions were not in our favor. What he's saying is that we have pursued those distortions to the ultimate, to the point where we, we, we lost our own identity as a, and for example, the concept of Ubuntu, it's a, it's a holistic definition. Whether you are in the North of Africa, anywhere, you will find that this is, is a uniting concept. We are people because we belong. But that distortion, that the distortion of Ubuntu has made us become much more individualistic. Now, what I want to check with, uh, um, um, without being an advocate, I think he, he will be able to say it himself. But what I want to check is, um, what are the strategies that we need to put in place? Because the damage is so deep um, that uh, colonialists have done. What are the strategies that must put in place to achieve a new level of remembering the connectedness with the land, the connectedness with ourselves, with our spirituality and, and, and so forth and so forth. Because institutions of higher learning where these are supposed to happen, they are not happening. For example, when they talk about decolonization especially decolonization of education. How would you decolonize education when those who are still teaching you are the, the, the sons and daughters of the colonialists? Do you talk about decolonization only in terms of ensuring that there's free access to education, government pumping money into education? What are the strategies? What needs to give, give in in order for us to be free? And this, for me, is a, it's a bigger question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. I will now ask Ungoska Zimshauli to give her comment. Please unmute yourself, Ma. Uh, as I am also a board member of MRM representing the National House of Traditional Leaders, deployed by Inkos Matlang. Thank you very much. You know what? I'm also going, to, I wish to join the same class we're talking about, a class like Prof, Prof Zondi. I'm at, at my age of 61, joining that class, really. But starting from really, we, we appreciate your, 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 your presentation, and we know that we, as traditional leaders, we are looking forward to, to, to correct whatever is, is, has gone wrong especially on issues of culture. And we said we are going to identify those cultural practices that are harmful to women and children. So we are, we are, we are working together. Also coming to uh, the issue of languages. Uh, thank you very much because we had, I, I was part of a, the webinar uh, led uh, by our uh, Mama, uh, I had forgotten now, but we're talking about, oh, Mama, Mama, um, we're talking about the issue of language and its impact on the issues of us accessing 
the, 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 whatever support to access as communities. And I think now as we, we have identified some of the presenters here, there's, what, there's a reason that you have been identified. Now, when moving forward, that doesn't, we need to check on how are we going to do, or to, to deal with the issue of reconstruction. After such a long time, it's almost 26 years in democracy. It's only now we are talking about reconstruction and, 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 and decolonizing. After so many years now, we, we have been talking about this, but now from this, this, this webinar, let's say, let's find a way of who, whom are we going to identify to take this forward? Is it uh, 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 the, the, the traditional leaders? Is it uh, the, 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 whoever? I'm just, just giving an example, uh, uh, professors, the, 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 the acad acad academics to achieve this. Because most of the time we, we, we come up with resolutions, but not attaching anyone to these resolutions. That's the main challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm so uh, uh, humbled to be part of these discussions. Uh, I, I, that is only, I'm going to join your class really, like Mahatma, because we are learning a lot here. And we know exactly, as we are fighting from, uh, from even from families, some of the family uh, uh, disputes are, are exactly coming from what you have just identified. I'm sure when you are talking, we're just uh, trying to, to, to find a way of, uh, of, of resolving the disputes amongst ourselves. As, as uh, for instance, as, as communities, as traditional uh, uh, communities, also as countries, different countries, because this is also affecting the different countries. Thank you very much. Sabulela Mama. Um, you mentioned, Hori, you come from Limpopo. Limpopo, yes. AM. And Limpopo Obo mentioned a, a good number of, of remedies and herbs. Yes. Joale, her professor, Li Ntatemasang Babu Wajualeka tradition. When I want to heal myself, as an example, and mm. want to come to Limpopo, which might not even be called Limpopo. Mm. Who will own those herbs? Jekaha Professor Zondi Sare Tula Hazagari Sohoj. Who will? Kimanga Tankang ownership. Yeah, the herbs. Traditional healers. The Pekuki traditional healers. It's a traditional healers. Yes. Has it a ronak or fail? It because of Rena, I read it even sometimes. Okay, okay. Now, my background tells the story because when I grew up, my aunt was a traditional healer. Then we, we, we used to go and collect them at the mountain, and we did collect them because I grew up on a farm. Oh, yes. yes, and okay. they belonged to her as a traditional healer. But fortunately, because I was there when it happened, I know them more than what I have mentioned now. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, mm. so I can ask all of you who are happy. Yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> now coming back to, there's a comment from Mathodi Ramoba. She says, thank you very much to be part of this meeting. Let's reconstruct and know our identity. Um, Bab Zondi, following on from Ungoska Zimtlauli, who would you recommend can start this process? And who should actually start it? Is it academics? Is it the National House of Traditional Leaders, is it MRM, who should actually start after 26 years? 
Thank you very much. I suspect Abantu, Batu. I, I suspect those who have come to a realization that before anything, Ribatu. And for us, when we say Batu, we, 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 we mean more than the word in English, human being. We mean filled human being who are filled with the spirit of being human, with a mind of being human, with relational power, which is human. Because it's not human to be individualistic. It's human to be social and work with others. Let's see my another. So when we say we are human, we, we mean rediscovering how to be human again, because where we are, we are not human. First, I'm Zulu, which is not true. Uh, second, I am man, which is not true. Thirdly, I am a professor, which is not true. That's, what identity is that? If I come before my ancestors, I come before God, what, what identity would be professor? The only things that colonialism has taught us to place value in are meaningless, which is why in the story, in the true story of Africans, Seldom are individuals elevated. I heard Nkos Matangu talking about some, some nations were named after people. No nation was named after people. But now, who now are called Mandebe are linked to um, Ziligazi, which is just now, 18, 1830s. Now recently, 1830s. If I accept that identity of, of, of Undebele, which is in the 1800s, of Zulu, of Tswana and all that, it simply means Africaners are older than me because Africaners are already Africaners in 1648. They already exist in 1648. I only, the birth of a Zulu nation, 1823. That means I'm new in this area. Something fundamentally wrong with that idea. Now, if you think about Amandebele, what do you call Amandebele? By 1486 already, there is trace of these people who were named. Come again. Come again. Come again. Come again. Can Mambulelwa Tojo tell us who I need Sorry, apologies, Professor. Yes. Thank By 1483, the people that Amanda Bele traced themselves with, it's not the Muslims, 1843. 14, so 1483, which is 400 years before Musilgas, which is almost 100 years before Musi. And they themselves call themselves, you know how we know how they call themselves? It's because they moved up to Lake, uh, to Lake uh, Malawi. They needed to introduce themselves to the others. You know what they call themselves? Abengoni. Abenguni, and then it became Goni because of how they, they pronounce it. To this day, those people are called Abangoni, who are in Malawi, who are in Tanzania, uh, who are in Zambia. To this day, they said we Abangoni. That's how they introduced themselves. They continue to introduce themselves even later, even in the time of Musilgazi. They never introduced themselves as Ndebele. Because Ndebele is named by Afrikaners in that small town next to Rustenburg, who were trying to say, these are the people who are chasing after other people, but they are the other people, according to the Sutu of the time, the, the Sutuana of the time. And then gave the story of Mzirigazi as chasing after people. And then these people who are going with him, what kind of a nation can be named after chasing after people? Can it be named as a criminal? Could it be that the Africans themselves named themselves as criminal? I doubt. It's very clear to me that this was invented by the other to create a particular notion. Zulu becomes Zulu, naming a people who already exist to call themselves Abanguni, to call themselves Abantu. And the, the, the A.T. Brandt and Sir Theophilus Shepstein, who was then called Somtseuka Sonzika, so that it sounds very Zulu, but it's an Englishman. Somtseuka Sonzika asks them, who is the ancestor of your, of your king? 
they count until they get to Zulu and then and then they get better than that. And then he likes Zulu. Then you are now gonna be called Zulu because where he came from, which is Germany, they have tribes here who don't have tribes. He needed to find what he knows from home, which is tribes. He was not tolerant of a people who were gonna call them Batu, call them Batu. 300 kilometers later, another area, speaking a different language, they also call themselves Batu. No, 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 no. We need to tribalize these people so that they have proper modern identities, which are tribal identities. You know what I'm saying? Even now, I'm a little bit looking at, and uh, people who are looking at, then the Bella story is now being dark even more because there was an insult in the name. It couldn't be that the people themselves called that. But we now know how they introduce themselves among the, the other people. Even when they got uh, other people who came from this side of the, of, the, of the world, in parts of Zambia, the western part of Zambia, they, those people call themselves Bakololo, Bakololo, and they spoke mm -hmm. Setswana, uh, Sipedi, and Singuni at the same time. And the people who call Mandebele today spoke those three languages always and equally. When did they learn to be just Ndebele and reject other things? When did they learn to be esoteric and inward looking? We're just illustrating with them. Even Bakololo, they go in there and learn other languages and adopted other language. So there's something to be done about that. To this day, in a place called Mzuzu, if you know Nguni, you will know Mzuzu, what Mzuzu means. It was a moment in time, moment in time. The people, there are people, in, the whole of Mzuzu has a collection of people who speak Singuni, it's a lie to call it Sizulu, because Sizulu does not exist as a language. Ndebele, what we call Sindebele, Sikosa, Siswati, they're all Nguni languages and Nguni dialects of Nguni. In other words, they are one mega language. If they could discover that, then they would realize they're not just 8 million Zulu, 6 million Kosa, 3 million this. They are a huge group of people. That is what the colonial order does not work. Where's, there's something else. The people you call Basutu, they are part of a lineage of people that go all the way to the north of Nigeria. Because Africa at some point had about five nations and all of those nations had totems and the totems were animals. Elephant, a crocodile, a bird, and um, 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 a monkey and a cow. To this day, when when the Africaners invented when the Africaners invented surnames, because we also don't have surnames, which is why if we look at the early kings, the king Musi of Mandebele is Musi who. There is no surname. Even if we go to later on Mziligaz, Mziligaz who, it's not Mziligaz Kumalo. Kumalo was his grandfather. It's not a surname. It was Mzilika Ka Kumalo. Ka of Kumalo. Shaga. Ka Senzanga Khan. The, the fact that it's Zulu, the surname Zulu is invented because again, the Germans have surnames because they are a patriarchal society where you must have a name of a sir in your family. Sir name. It's not a, it's not a maiden name. It's a surname. We don't have that. We are a matrilineal society here where the female is the significant figure. You see what I mean? We don't do that thing in this world, but we've been taught to be patriarchal. We cannot be lashed for being patriarchal, but patriarchal is not our original state. It was given to us, which is why the, the, the person, the leader of Makololo, the leader of the very same Bangoni people was a woman. Makololo was a woman. The leader of the people who, went, who ended up in Angola was a woman before Queen Zinga. They had leaders who were women. I hear people right now who can't have a male. The male lineage is a, is, is a Germanic tribal order and tradition. It's not our tradition. The missionaries brought it and they interpreted a Christianity that is male centric as well. So all of those are we need to think about. So, but the question was, how do we start? In my view, 
we begin to solve a problem by knowing a problem. The people of the Turkana Valley in the, in the north of Kenya have a saying which says, however long a log of wood stays underwater, it does not become a crocodile. In other words, it must be discovered that it is a wood, it's not a real thing. Secondly, then they say that they who cut, who fail to cultivate, they say their ground is stony. They don't say they fail to cultivate, they find a reason for that. Lastly, they say that a snake you do not see is a danger to you, but the one you see is not a danger to you. So that which we do not know is that which will prison us all our lives. Mm -hmm. And the colonial order of system is that you go through 12 years of schooling from first year to matric, and you learn a lot about the, party, the, the properties of water, the properties of the air, the soil structure. We learn a lot about the properties of the language, the, the alphabet and all of those things. Nowhere throughout that 12 year of schooling do you discover who you are. Yet it is called education. Education means to reveal what was not known. And you go through all the way, become a professor like me, discover everything, but not discover these things we are talking about, about who we are. It is a design of a system for us not to know who we are. And therefore it is an attack on the system for us to discover who indeed we are. But we must be careful when we discover that, that we do not discover it along the indigenous tribal element because we only discover my Zuluness, which is not complete. I must discover it in a way that reconciles me with the rest of the continent that I belong to, with the rest of the region, with the rest of the Nguni, Sutu, mm. uh, broader society. That is for me, it's a very important one. The second duty we have is to make another person conscious of it. There's no point getting something revealed to me and I don't share it with other people. Yeah. And that is how the system killed us that I would not share with others. And the last I, one is to mm -hmm. teach a new generation a new truth that they will never discover in a school, I guarantee you. It doesn't matter that the school is now run by us black people. By design, that school is not meant to reveal. It is meant to teach them to, to fill up the facts in order they can, so that they can find a job, not so that they become sovereign people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Gebab. Ususo ba principal tina si student. I think all of us here are be educated further. I've got some comments. Um, I'm not sure who SS is, and the message says yes, the damage is deep, but why is it that we can't seem to self-correct? Why do we take so long? Yes, an ideology is spun over a long period of time and is pervasive, none escapes its effect. But it seems there's no commitment to change as a people. We seem to all be benefit from the status quo and to a certain extent, we still perpetuate the divide and rule strategy. I will just share on the messages and Niha would like to make a comment over to you. Niha, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, program director. Uh, I'm Niha for today because she's using my profile to manage this meeting. But uh, my name is Neo Neo Chag, uh, and I must really thank all the speakers for their input. I think this is quite an interesting and a very important discussion that we are having today uh, because uh, we've been using decolonizing as a slogan and sloganizing about it but we have not really delved deep into what is required of us to really start working towards decolonization uh, when you talk to psychologists or life coaches they will tell you about something that they call uncharted territory or uncharted space, which is a space where you really don't even understand 
the space that you are in, but it's a space where you are most vulnerable. So for me, and from uh, what the speakers have said, is that first of all, we need to ask ourselves as a country and as an African nation that are we ready to get into that space? Because what Professor uh, Zondi is raising is the, some of the issues that are still problematic in our country today, and they were brought to us by colonizers. Uh, I've also done some, you know, a short, uh, well, desktop research around the Basutu nation. Now, Kimusutu, as an early Kimusutu, it's Now, Litama, it's Kilibito Lamrena Mushweshwe. It's the name of Morena Mushweshwe. Now, as Basutu, when we identify ourselves, we will say Rebana, Banta de Kabovali Tama, which is Morena Mushweshwe, before we say Rebasutu, when we use our language. Uh, so it, it further gives proof or, or, or assure you to, to what Professor Zondi is saying. And you would also find it interesting that, and I like uh, uh, the input that you've just made, uh, Professor Zondi, about the totems as well. Basutu, Batswana, Lebapedi, they have one linkage, they have one root. We are one people. We oh. just divided according to the different areas in which we lived within the African continent. That is why you would find the Mufuking in Botswana, in Botswana nation, and you would also find the Mufuking in the Basotho nation as well, because we come from the same roots. Now, one thing that is always going to be problematic, especially when we talk about the unity of Africa, it's the tribal or the tribes that we have been given by our colonizers. So for me, it's going to be difficult to relate to a, a, a Zulu speaking person or a person from the Zulu nation, because I would want to identify myself as a Musutu first, which is an identity that I, was, I have been given by, my, by our colonizers. And as long as we're going to continue perpetuating that mentality, we will never see ourselves as being part of Africans in the African continent. And that is why today it is so easy for our young people to be influenced by the Western uh, uh, cultures, by Western ideologies, by Western ways of doing things because we have stuck or we are stuck on our uh, 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 identities that were given by our uh, uh, colonizers. As you talk about the history of uh, Ushara, Professor Zondi, the history of Mushesha, they will tell you that Mushesha was so receptive to the British. He even gave them land. He liked them very much. Uh, and he liked them because the British could protect him from Shaga. So that also starts giving you, as a Musutu, uh, an assumption that, oh, so the Zulu nation has always been attacking us as, as, as Basutu. But researchers, they have found Uguti in the Battle of Isandrana. There were Basutus that were part of that battle that were fighting against the British. There were lots of Basutus that were fighting against the British. Now, this notion that uh, Mushashwe liked the British so much, where how does it fit in uh, if you find that there were Basutus in the Battle of Isandrana? So my, my, my contribution is that as we deal with the decolonizing uh, of our history, of our uh, identity as the African nation, one, we need to ask ourselves whether are we ready to go into a chartered territory. Secondly, uh, and from what is coming up from this uh, conversation, is that are we willing to let go of the labels that we were given by our colonizers and start searching to say, because if you talk, if you talk about the labels, I mean, we all know that Mzugazi left uh, uh, from Shaga, and ended up residing in, uh, in, 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 in Zimbabwe. Now, would you say the Ndebeles in Zimbabwe are not related to the uh, Zulus in the Gaza then? So it shows that, uh, in fact, I'm adding to what Professor Zundi is saying, that we need to even go to an extent of, I know we cannot do it physically, but bringing down the borders in terms of understanding ourselves as the African people. We need to look beyond borders. We need to look beyond, and we know how the African borders came about. 
We need to look beyond the borders, beyond the labels, beyond what the colonizers have told us and start searching for who we really are and what we really are in building the African uh, identity. Thank you very much, Program Director. Um, from the Royal House in Lesotho. Ntate ki kimziligaz kwa hakumalo. Umtuungwa. And umtuungwa gyaz gukona ama relative yengi nao gwandebele akona na se Zimbabwe. So ka Rikiri eya, you know, kimutu, hakisali musutu, hakisali muzulu, hakisali muzulu, I mean, hakisali nkari mupedi, me khatla, rebatu, serelebatu. And ngitanda njuguti ngbonge gwe na Professor Zondi, ngpinde ngbonge na gu, iko si mashango, ngbonge na gu nko sigazi, kilebu welue na me makhatla, kisa tibi nguri, Professor Musoma, Na wile afumana karaboya haye. Were we able to respond to Professor Musuma's um, question, Professor Zondi? I, I, I don't seem to recall. Gepa ge ngitela uwiti nfunde imesej gamam u faith ramaboka. Uti, we also need to discuss how far we can go in reconstructing our African identity as one people. One issue in particular is the language. We have diverse languages in South Africa. What does decolonization mean in the context of language, which for me is linked to our tribal or traditional identities? This is Umam Faith. And Ubab, okay. Please over to you. Your, your hand has been raised. No, th thank you, uh, program director. We keep on losing you. Um, in other instances, you're not audible enough. But I just wanted to, I appreciate, I think, uh, the analogy that has been brought by o Professor Zondi. Uh, but it, uh, suffice to say that uh, we are, yes, we are one. Um, and we need to build around uh, that oneness uh, as a country. And I think, um, I mean, just like he's a scholar, there's many other scholars that are giving uh, other uh, research uh, information. I think, uh, I mean, for me, as a person that uh, is in the valley here in South Africa, there's nothing that links me to Mzilikazi other than the fact that uh, we, we fought with Mzilikazi. Uh, because uh, when you refer to Amandebele, especially our side, we refer to ourselves as the Chaba Zaganzuza Namanan, because those were our leaders. And those were, uh, you know, yeah, so we call ourselves by that. So uh, the only thing that links us to Mzilikas uh, is the war that we fought now, yeah? just like any other tribe where he passed. Uh, so uh, Amandebele says Zimbabwe, uh, yeah, you know. Uh, they are, but they are not. We are not uh, the same people, even though we'd have uh, relatives uh, that that are there. And secondly, we history also directs us to Tina Singabase Embo Sibambo instead of the Nguni. I don't know. Maybe we would learn uh, as as we go. But uh, other uh, researchers are bringing information that does not necessarily link us to the Nguni. It links us to. And I'm not sure, would he, uh, oh, Prof, what would he have to say around that? What explanation would he give um, uh, around that? Yeah, but yeah, I think that we appreciate um, what we are learning today and what we are learning from different other scholars, because Prof is a scholar. Uh, he's done his research, and all other scholars that are coming to us, they've also done their own research. But I think what is important is that uh, we are one people. And I think that's what we need to be striving for, uh, that when we come up with these uh, tribal connotations in most cases, we sometimes seek 
uh, to divide ourselves. But it is also appreciated that you, if I know uh, I need to know that, you know, as an African, uh, before I appreciate uh, being part of a bigger group, because I think that's where it starts. Uh, you know, that you are part of this family and you acknowledge being part of this family and the roots within that family. Then, yeah, only then uh, uh, you are part of a larger group uh, being us as Abandu uh, or Abandu, uh, as the prophets put it. Uh, that, that, that is my contribution, thanks. <laughs> Ngingazi Babu Zondi, do you have any comments? Um, um, I, I, I agree with what has been, uh, has been said, uh, because the, the purpose is to um, unmask um, the colonial narratives that were meant to, de to design how we see ourselves and, and how we, we, we advance going forward. So I will respectably uh, disagree with Inkos, with good respect. Um, um, Amanda Bele, who are, or people who are called Amanda Bele who are in, in, in Zimbabwe, are related uh, to you, Baba, just as I am related to you very closely. Uh, even our languages share, our cultures, our traditions, very similar. Uh, and we are related to the Nguane people. Uh, what became called Swati later, again, which was a colonial invention, the Bang 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 and, 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 and other people. Uh, you are related to them um, because uh, this distinction about this element and that element um, it is useful if you want to get a little bit of details, but what I was trying to illustrate is that in 1483 already, those people, Bamusi, who and Zuz and Rebele, as they are called, they were already in the south of Zambia. 14, imagine that, 1483, long before the white people even arrived there, 400 years before Mzilgazi. And they introduced themselves as Abenguni, because Abenguni, are uh, a people, both Basutu and Banguni, come from an area called Embo. But Embo is not a, a geography. It's not, you can't find it. It's not in a map, you can't find it. Embo simply was a, a concept of Eden in, 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 in Western language. Because Eden, you also can't find it. I know I heard they said Garden of Eden is next to Iraq. It's a lie. Because it's a story of creation. It's not a particular area of creation. And that is what joins the Sutu side and the Nguni side together. It's this embo um, um, element, which simply really means where people are Bambi, Wakona, where they originated from. They, that's what their source of pride. And that is why. Um, Amazulu themselves, uh, especially next to the Ukashamba, uh, like calling themselves Abambo, Abambo, because they are trying to uh, disengage with the idea Amazulu, 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 because that's the same name of a person. As I indicated, many people in this area do not believe in creating individuals and name themselves under individuals. It's not normal. It's not our way of doing things. We don't name things after, we name things after rivers, we name things after natural, after water. If there's anything where somebody is named after people, then you should know if things had changed dramatically when that happened. So what, that is a, the logic of our story right now, that the logic of a story that says, I must now defend my Zuluness and even kill for it, it, it is, is not my, my identity is to find, even if I embrace my students, but to embrace it knowing that it, I am related to a whole lot of other people going all the way to Lake Chad. And those people are different. Those people are, I am related to Botswana and the, this division between Nguni and all that is also not true. So if we could get to a point where you, we are at peace with coexisting with others, 
and we destroy the boundaries that were created by colonialism, which we become attached to because now they become a sort of life and death issues for us. The most important message of coming out today is that we are a common people. For a long time, we called ourselves Batu, and that is perhaps the most important identity because that identity has an, a philosophy. Other identities, Zulu has no philosophy, but identity of Abatu has a philosophy called Ubuntu, has a culture called Isintu, has a, 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 a way of being which is called, called Hindu. And you can, you, can, you can elaborate on all that. It also connects me with people for about 70% of the, of, 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 of the continent. So it's an identity worth preserving uh, because that will also help us build regional integration, build a strong continent and uh, recover ourselves and, and become stronger. Because in this world, a, a people who are small portions are always losers. A people who are a big portion are always winners. The Chinese have over a 500 ethnicities, but they, they emphasize their original identity, which is called the Hanness. So they overlook all these kind of because as Nyerere said, for the nation, for the, us as nationalities we are, we must de-emphasize tribal, tribal identities so that we can elevate the other identities which we, we share. Even our languages uh, are, are shared common. Lastly, um, I did answer a professor, I did respond to Professor Musoma and I said, for me, the first thing, the first weapon against the system is to know. To know is a, a weapon, because the weapon of the system is ignorance. For us not to know, it's usually, it's usually it, it helps it. The second weapon is to ask questions, is to question the inherited story. Because remember, even the story of the Zulu has been passed down by black people, but black people were colonized too. The fact that I'm black doesn't mean I'm not colonized. The black people who are born, that we get stories to, are born now in the late 1800s and early 1900s. That is 500 years after colonialism. So they are also passing stories because the system infused this, use mission station, use schools, use the media, and use all of these things uh, to uh, give them a story they must pass on to the next generation, so that the older story. That is why those who rebelled wanted to have their own stories were killed. Those who rebelled wanted to insist that their people, they had their head chopped off because those were problematic ones and were preserved if you, if, if, if you, if you did not resist that bad. And lastly, whatever we do, let us remember there was a curse put upon us. The way our people were killed, the way they were buried, the things that were said about us and the story men are, were all meant to create a spiritual curse. Let's not forget that. And Amakos in our, in our language, they are all both priests and kings, and they are also educators and unifiers. And they, we must use that institution that exists to make sure that we, we don't deal with only one segment and leave the spiritual segment because that is what causes us from time to time, we kill each other for, for next to nothing, for a, we call it black on black violence. There's a curse upon us. The things we do to each other is a curse upon us. The way we think about each other, the way we hate each other more than we hate a white man, it's a curse upon us. I believe as all Africans did before this modern life, that a human being is spiritual and is also physical. Those two areas must both be healed that is why South Africa will never be fine until this land is healed, until the spirit of a people is healed. We can do all sorts of things to build a democracy. It, it won't work because we were attacked at a spiritual, cultural, a psychological, and physical level. More than anything, the Batu. Thank you so much, Batu. Thank you.
kaniti rebatu singa bantu aisi abonga baba e father mkajwa i think this calls for another webinar because two hours was just not enough um we we, we really need to still dwell um into who we are and as o professor zondi has summed it up that we first need to seek we first mm. need to know mm. we can be no. stronger mm. um i'm having internet connectivity problems and to close up um but from my end to professor Gibonge also for actually bringing this opportunity to all of us. Gifundile mina namchanje nchaga ntukula izolo. Sengi azazi gane uguti gimbubani. I'm not sure if you'd like to say any words. Um, or, or actually maybe first need to take pride of who has issues of land um, within our country and ourselves. And also that we, we, we need to just still know, we need to get to know who we are. We must not stop searching. And yes, over to you, Adam Kaj. Father Kajwa, you are on mute, Father. Am I back now? Can you hear me now? Yes, Father. Yeah, you can hear me. Right, uh, program director, just to thank you and th once again, thank everybody for uh, their participation. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we are very grateful that uh, we've had such a very good session and I agree with you, program director, that maybe should this should just be regarded as the beginning. Yeah, it was on. <laughs> Yes, uh, this should be regarded as just as the beginning, I think, of a, a long journey, a journey that hopefully will be uh, joined by others, because this is a huge, huge, huge subject that obviously um, uh, is facing us and also facing people in our institutions of, uh, of learning, people in the area of uh, religion and culture and so on. So once again, everybody, thank you very much and stay uh, stay safe. And we very much appreciate your contribution and MRM will ensure that we find a way of um, continuing this dialogue. Thank you very much.